and has logged over 200 hours in space and is now here to give us his unique perspective on the training and working. One of our favorites, please help me welcome Captain John McBride. Yeah. Glad to see you all made it through it. It was tough, right? Well, you, you got in about four or five hours, what it, what it takes us about a year to do over in Houston, Texas, where we... Uh, one of the, let me answer some of the often asked questions, and then you can ask me some questions. But people say, well, how long is the training? Well, you went through a real quick session today. Uh, training to be an astronaut starts, I think, in school. Uh, youngsters, I mean, I, if I talk to youngsters in the fourth or fifth or sixth grade, I tell them your training starts today because you have to get a good education. Every astronaut and cosmonaut has been through college pretty much, so it's going to take you a while to get your education and you got to do well at it, study hard. Once you get your education, then NASA doesn't say, okay, we're going to take you and train you to be a pilot. We're going to take you and train you to be an oceanographer. We're going to train you to be a physicist. No, that's not the way it works. You've got to go learn those things on your own. I spent 13 years in the United States Navy flying airplanes. I was a test pilot. I had to fly just about every airplane. We've... I like to tell people I've flown everything from the Goodyear blimp to the space shuttle <laughs> and everything in between, all the gliders, uh, helicopters, Navy Air Force airplanes, uh, commercial airliners, you name it, I've been in it, got to fly it, so I've been a lucky person. But you, after you're trained to be a pilot or trained to be a medical doctor or trained to be an astrophysicist in your laboratory, your hospital, your, your military service, then NASA says, okay, now you're kind of qualified to come down to Houston and be trained to be an astronaut. And it could take 15 years maybe out of high school, after high school, to get your college education and get your five or ten years of practical experience as a pilot or a doctor or a scientist or an engineer and all that's training all that's training then when you get to NASA they're going to give us about two years it's like going back to college for another master's degree maybe two years of college or two years of training on what it takes to be an astronaut astronaut training so and uh, we learn things like well you have to learn things so when you're in space and you're looking toward the universe or looking toward the earth and people ask you questions, you can answer them. So we learn oceanography, uh, geology, volcanology, that's the study of volcanoes, uh, plate tectonics, solar planetary physics. We do a lot of medical. Our doctors in our class teach us the, the anatomy of the human body for several weeks. Uh, so you can see after a couple of years of that basic training, you're pretty well knowledgeable. You've spent all your time in your service or your hospital or your astronomy lab or observatory. And so after this first two years, all of us are kind of equal then. We know a little bit about just about all kinds of things. That's, that's part of the basic astronaut training. And when you finish that, technically you're now qualified to be assigned to a mission. That may take another year or so. I spent uh, a little over a year as a capsule communicator after the basic training, talking to the spacecraft as the voice of Houston in the control center. Uh, then I was assigned to a flight. That's normal. Maybe three or four years after you get to NASA, you'll get your first assignment. So once again, it's going to be nearly 20 years after high school to get your education, get your practical experience, and then go to NASA and get your basic training, and then your specific mission training to go fly a flight. So. It's not an easy thing to do, and I'll guarantee you it's well worth every moment that you spent in preparation to learn all these things and to have the opportunity to come down here or bike an oar. Now I have three nations who are launching people into space. We do ours from here at Kennedy. My Russian friends do theirs from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And now we have mainland China launching people into space. So we call our guys astronauts. You call your guys cosmonauts. <laughs> And the ty Chinese call their guys? Taikonauts. Taikonauts, yes. So we've got three different types of people that fly into space with three different languages now. And we have had, you uh, <coughs> can check, recall. We've got, a, I've got, <coughs> we've got one Czech astronaut. We now have uh, 38 nations. And we haven't invited Martin Gentile yet, maybe one of these guys. <laughs> yeah? Would you like to do that? Yeah. Good deal, I like it. We're, uh, we got three or four countries from South America who've flown people into space, Brazil, uh, Peru, uh, 
Costa Rica, which is Central America, Mexico. Getting close to Argentina. <laughs> uh, but we now have 38 nations who've flown people into space in 50 years. And I, I say 39 if I count West Virginia, where I come from here in America. It's a little old <laughs> independent nation right in the middle of the United States. It's a, it's a state. We kind of, we fancy ourselves as being kind of independent. Um, so today's a big day. As a matter of fact, at the Kennedy Space Center this, this afternoon, this evening, we have uh, John Glenn and Scott Carpenter there, and, uh, very dear friends of mine. I, one of the greatest uh, things in my life, I was president of all the astronauts and cosmonauts of the world for three years. So I've got, and, and being first class of space shuttle astronauts, this is our class, yeah, 35 of us picked in 1978. Being in that early class of first class of special astronauts, I got to know all the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo guys. And of course, being in the first class of shuttle people, I got to know everybody after that. So it's been a wonderful storied career for me. I couldn't have asked for anything else. And I'm going to go out after we finish here and spend some time with John Glenn and Scott Carpenter. John Glenn's our first American to orbit the Earth. He was not the first man to orbit the Earth, the first man to. Going to space was also the first man to orbit the Earth, and he was from Russia, and his name was Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. He was the first, and he flew in April of 1961, April the 12th. And uh, less than a month later, Alan Shepard was our first man to go in from America, go into space on the Mercury, cap Mercury capsule. I'm not much taller than myself, just enough room to get the astronaut in there and <laughs> launch him into space. And Alan and, as a matter of fact, Alan Shepard and the first two, well, the first two astronauts, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, did not go around, around the Earth. They just went up and back in the water, right off the coast here. We wanted to prove that we could get somebody into space and get them back to Earth safely before we Americans put somebody into orbit. But Yuri did it all. He did one revolution in, in the first flight. Uh, so they, they all started in 1961, the first flights of Amer people into space. And, uh, it was a very happy day for us when Alan Shepard, sole purpose of Mercury, by the way, was to prove that we could get somebody up there and get them back in one big piece. And we were very happy when we recovered that Mercury capsule to open the hatch, and Alan Shepard still had both arms, <laughs> still could walk, still could see and hear. It was a very, so that was a success. And we had a young president by the name of John F. Kennedy, who just about two weeks after Alan Shepard made that historic flight, stood before all of us Americans here and said, we're going to send a man to the moon. <laughs> believe that. It's hard to believe. You know, one little suborbital flight, and now we're going to go to the moon. So it really took a lot of, I'd say, fortitude, bravado, for John Kennedy to make a statement like that with just one little singular lofting parabolic maneuver we call it into the Atlantic Ocean. So, but we did it. Uh, to get there we had to fly six of those Mercury flights and we built a bigger capsule called Gemini. Put two people in it. And Gemini taught us how to go outside and do spacewalks, EVA, extravehicular activities. Gemini taught us how to rendezvous and dock spacecraft in orbit. Uh, the longest crew spent almost two weeks in Gemini to prove that we could live there long enough to make a trip to the moon back to Earth. So finally with those successes of Mercury and Gemini then we built the Apollo spacecraft and the Saturn Saturn rocket that you see out at the Space Center and sent our crews to the moon. First one uh, landed on the moon in 1969. One of the things that President Kennedy said we're going to land a man on the moon by the end of this decade. He said it in 1961 so we made it. We landed the first crew on the moon in 1969 in July on Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first two men to walk on the moon. So, and all during this period, as a matter of fact, when the Russians launched Sputnik and we launched our explorers and early days of the space program, I was in high school. It really got me charged up. All this, this rockets and airplanes and things. So it really was the primary factor that I got into aerospace was the early space program here and in Russia. And that excited me. I was in the Navy flying airplanes when Alan, when uh, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, Navy fighter pilot. And the whole time I was in the Navy, for about 13 years before I got to go to NASA, I uh, 
kind of looked at what Alan Shepard and John Glenn, Wally Shira, Scott Carpenter, all the guys that wear these gold wings like me, what did they do while they were in the Navy? I did exactly the same thing. I went to test pilot school. I worked on an advanced degree in college and got higher, more education. Flew on and off of aircraft carriers. I spent about four years at sea. Got about 600 landings and takeoffs from aircraft carriers. The beautiful part of my Navy career is my landings match my takeoffs. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. After 13 years, NASA said we were looking for people to fly this brand new spacecraft called Space Shuttle, and I. I was ready. It wasn't like I just woke up that morning and said, I'd like to be one of those guys. As I said, I had been planning for many years. I'm telling the youngsters, if it's something you want to do, this is a time to start thinking about it. So I was ready, put my application in, went through about a year-long screening process. And after a year, NASA chose 35 of us out of about 9,000 finalists. So obviously I was very fortunate, lucky, blessed is a good English word, to have been chosen in that first class of space shuttle astronauts. And there, out of the 35, there were 15 of us who were pilots, and we all are military pilots. The other 20 people are uh, scientists. They're mission specialists, a new category of astronauts called mission specialists. Sally Ride and the other first American women were in my class. The first African Americans were in my class. First Mountaineer from West Virginia, obviously, was in my class. <laughs> uh, it was a great group of people, and all 35 of the people that NASA chose got to fly at least one mission into space. So it was real good uh, selection and training, and that each and every one of us made it all the way through to where we got to fly at least one mission into space. I took the first crew of seven, this one right here. First Canadian, Mark Gardner. Uh, first Aussie, it's close to New Zealand, but. There's a joke between the yeah, we didn't like them. The Kiwis, the Aussies, and I won't even get into that. I spent time in both countries, and, uh, both beautiful places. I love New Zealand; it's a particularly beautiful place. Uh, so we, I took the first crew of seven with the first two folks from other four native, other than Americans. Uh, first crew of two women. Sally Ride was on board. She's the first American woman, but this this was her second flight. She was in my class. And also had a classmate by the name of Kathy Sullivan, her first flight, but on this mission she became the first American woman to go outside and do an EVA. So it was a very unique group of people, and uh, if I'd handpicked a crew, I don't think I could have done any better than NASA issued me to fly with. And we trained for about a year and a half and did an eight and a, eight and a half day mission. Space Shuttle was designed to do many things. It spent its, uh, roughly its last 30 missions building the International Space Station. <coughs> taking up big pieces to the space station, which is up there now, fully completed. We've got 15 nations now involved in the operation of our space station. It's going around the Earth every 90 minutes, every hour and a half. We've had people on board the space station now for more than 10 years, so we've kind of opened up a whole new era in, in the history of humanity that perhaps for the rest of our futures here as humans, hopefully, we'll have people in orbit or on our moon or other places in our solar system. So it could be that we've opened a whole new era in human exploration by having somebody continually in space now for more than 10 years. 15 nations. So it's a uh, space shuttle's retired now, unfortunately. We flew our last flight last July. We, we flew it 135 times during the 30 years that we flew our space shuttles. We built five of them. Uh, the first one we flew was Columbia. When we launched uh, John Young and Bob Cripp and Mayor Kennedy in 1981, I was the little airplane overhead. When they lifted off, if they'd had to come back and make a landing, I would have joined them, flown down with them. Thankfully, they didn't do that. They went on into orbit, went around 35 times, and landed at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And I got to go out and beat them two days later as they came back and made the historic landing back in April of 1981. So I've been around a long time. It's been a wonderful career, though. I've probably seen. 75 of the 135 launches and a lot of the landings here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we've landed the space shuttle, by the way, in three different places. Our primary landing site is here at Kennedy. We'd like to land where we launch. Obviously, if we're landing where we launch, we just tow the space shuttle across the runway and put it in the building and get it ready for the next flight. If we have to land at our second site, which is Edwards Air Force Base in California, or the third one is uh, White Sands in New Mexico, 
then we have the only way we can get our shuttle back to Florida is to put on our 747 and fly it from west coast to east coast, just like we did when they were built. All the shuttles were built in California, and the only way we can get them from California to Florida is to fly them piggyback, we call it, on top of the 747 jet to back to. So that, that could take a week or two weeks, depending on the weather, to get the shuttle back to Florida. So obviously we would like to land here. And we'll, we have enough of, uh, we call them consumables. You had consumables in your shuttle this morning. Breathing air, food, water. We have to take all that stuff with us. And we don't take, you can't stay up there forever. If our mission is 11 days scheduled, we'll take probably enough food and water for maybe 13, 14, 15 days. So you can stay two or three extra days, and we'll try to do that to see if we can wait on a good clear day here in Florida to come back and make the landing, because we know if we have to land in California, it's going to take an extra time period to get it back to Florida. So we have waited. But obviously you can't stay forever if it looks like the weather's never going to get good here. On a, and Florida does weather in for a week at a time. And we don't want to fly through rain or thunderstorms in the space shuttle, so we'll go to California and fly back. We think, I think, and most of us think that probably the space shuttle had just gotten to its maturity when we uh, retired it, unfortunately. It was flying better than it ever had. <coughs> when you think about it, I'm a test pilot, and we, uh, if I'm going to let an airplane be released to the public for everybody to fly, we're going to fly that airplane three or four or five hundred times, test everything, make sure everything's working before we let anybody even get close to a new airplane. Well, the shuttle just flew 135 times, now we're stopping. So, uh, a lot of us think it was a little premature. And one, of the, one of the problems I have and others is that we now don't have the capability to launch anybody from Kennedy for two or three years until we come up with a new <coughs> way of launching people from Kennedy to get them into space. So, kind of a, a delay, so to speak. We're not sure how long. It all depends on Sadly, it all depends on politics. Every nation has politics, right? And uh, so we're hoping that our Congress uh, will rejuvenate, revitalize our space program and get it back to where it used to be. I won't stop talking. <laughs> Got some time to answer questions if you have any. My Spanish is not too good. But <laughs> I hope your English is better than my Spanish. Porquito. So what do you think of the new options they're working on? Uh, I'm all in favor of uh, commercialization of low Earth orbit. I think it's time to do that. And we've got two or three people that are SpaceX and uh, a couple of other folks are working on getting us back into low Earth orbit with their commercial spacecraft. Hopefully, I don't think it's going to happen any sooner than three years. That'd be the earliest. I still think that to go back to the moon and on to Mars or asteroids or where we decide to go is a, is a NASA function. And, uh, so I still think there's deep research flights should be done by NASA to the, sometime down the road they're ready to be adapted to commercial sector. I, uh, I'm all for and NASA's charter, NASA's NASA was designed and chartered to develop all these technologies and turn them over to the people to use them. They belong to the people that paid the taxes to pay NASA to do them so they belong to you and uh, we do have a national transfer center here where all the technologies are available pretty much to anybody that wants to use them. And everybody in this room, everybody pretty much in this world to some extent is, a, is touched daily by all the space technologies that have been developed over the last 50 years. This thing right here, this camera. Uh, some of you have cell phones, uh, GPS is out in your cars. So from the time you get up in the morning you are touched by space technology and I, I envision that it will continue well in the future. Why, are we, why do we want to spend money to go to Mars? That's a good question. My answer is that just like the last 50 years, if we develop the technology to go to Mars, we will necessarily come up with uh, a means to recycle and reuse everything we take for the crew to go to Mars. It'll be about a two or three year voyage over time on the planet and back home. We can't carry enough food and water and consumables technology revived, we will find that way for us, amongst other hundreds of other things that we must do to pull off that mission. So there's a reason for it. Questions? Answers everyone. <laughs>
What was the longest shuttle mission in space then? I think the longest shuttle mission was 18 days. The longest an American has been in space was on space station. I think it's about 217 days. That's about seven months. The longest anybody's been in space is a couple of my cosmonaut friends have been up there for a year or longer, continually without coming back to Earth. My Russian friends have a lot more, I would call, longevity, more time in space than we do, but we've got more people and more sorties because of our space shuttle. It had take up to seven people per flight for and I think we flew as many as ten or ten flights in one year so it's a, you see there's more people more seats going back and forth to space but for total time in orbit I think my Russian friends have a speed pretty significant yes sir um, I imagine seeing earth from outer space is pretty amazing how would you describe it it's uh, kind of indescribable uh, you've seen a lot of pretty pictures of earth from space and I've taken thousands of them but uh, the thing you can't really envision or capture while well, I'm taking this one frame of film looking at maybe six or eight nations out one window <coughs> with one camera, I could still be doing this and see six nations that way and six nations that way, the whole 360 degree of your vision. And we can see about a thousand miles. What am I, well, to give you an idea, when you're flying down the middle of the United States, down the Mississippi River, going from Canada towards South America, Kind of going right down the road. I can look left and see the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. and look right west and see the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. So I can see all the United States of ours. Mm -hmm. When I'm over the middle of the Atlantic, I can look uh, east and see all of Europe, and look west and see the eastern coast of the United States. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite memories is over Australia and New Zealand after about 45 minutes after launch, we're on the other side of the Earth. It only takes an hour and a half to go around. So we're on over Australia after launch, and my job as a pilot is to uh, float back to the after part of the cockpit and set up the computer panel back here and hit a magic button that starts the payload bay doors open. That's my job. And I've never seen Earth from space before. So I hit the magic buttons and the doors start to open. Mm -hmm. I'm over Australia, heading toward New Zealand. God, I can't believe this. And as the doors got wider and wider, I could see all the way from Perth, almost halfway across the ocean over to New Zealand on the, on the eastern side, so in Sydney. So when it opened up and I saw that on my first vision of Earth, I just kept saying, how much luckier can a guy get mm -hmm. to be up here and see this and witness this kind of So you put that together, the vision, the weightlessness, we haven't even got into that. Living and working in weightlessness doing some great science and research with some great people around the Earth every hour and a half. One of the things also, I don't know whether they touched on it, but as we go around the Earth every hour and a half, about half of your orbit's between the sun and the Earth, so you're in sunshine. And I have a sunset. I go behind <laughs> the Earth for 45 minutes. And then I have a sunrise. And a sunset. And a sun. <laughs> and a sunset. 16 of them as I orbit the Earth 16 times a day. The sun out here on the beach is a beautiful okay when it rises in the morning. It takes us 15 or 20 minutes. It's beautiful. But the sun rises in space are 10 or 15 seconds. Because you're whisk to go around the earth every hour and a half, you've got to be traveling almost 18,000 miles an hour. So when you're traveling toward the sun at that rate of speed, it doesn't take it. It's up overhead 45 minutes and it gets dark. And one of the other things, obviously, when you're in the sunshine, you're absorbing a lot of heat from the, directly from the sun, so the skin of the spacecraft gets to be more than 200 degrees centigrade. When you go behind the Earth in the darkness, you can feel the spacecraft go shrink because you're going into darkness. It's minus 200 degrees on the surface of my spacecraft. So just this little 20 minute, 20 second period between sunset and darkness. The spacecraft has to survive a 500 degree shift in temperature. So it's pretty radical. And you can hear the air conditioner come on and you go into the sun and the heater come on and come by. <laughs> hope it works. Yeah, hope it works. <laughs> That's why these uh, pressure suits that we wear, there's a couple of them back there. Got to be, they weigh about 300 pounds. <coughs> so you can't walk around with them on Earth. <coughs> Obviously, it's okay to work in space, but it's kind of clumsy with fingers. You imagine doing all the 
meticulous work that we do with these big gloves. That's why we have to practice, 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 practice. But these spacesuits have got about 14 layers of material to keep you pressurized. There's no air outside your suit, so all your air has to be inside of you, breathing air. You have to have a cooling system that circulates hot water in the cold side and cold water in the hot side. Uh, you got to have your communications equipment and all those types of things, a little water to drink. And so they're very complicated suits, and they weigh about 300 pounds to accommodate all these different systems that you have to have to go outside and live in the back in the harshness of space. So, uh, it's like living in a little city, carrying your own city out there with you. How are we doing, Steve? Uh, we got a nice small group, so we have some time. Yeah, anybody have anything, anything else? else? Yes. Did you ever uh, get used to something so much in space that you tried to do it on Earth? Like, uh, did you ever drop something and forget it wasn't going to float? <laughs> we, yeah, everybody goes through that. It's, it, it's not so bad when you go up and adjust it to zero gravity, except, you know, when you get into zero gravity for the first couple of days, if you've never been there, and you're trying to navigate, you're probably going to push too hard. Boing, hit my head on the ceiling. <laughs> you learn to navigate around a space shuttle by just I won't go to the ceiling, you kind of just push with your big toe. And you, I'm up here on the ceiling sleeping. I can sleep right here in the prone position when I'll come down to the floor. I can just push here very gently and I start knocking down to the floor. So you get kind of lazy. It <laughs> takes you a day or two to adjust how to, how to navigate around the space shuttle without bumping your head, bumping your arms, running into switches. But it, after a couple of days, it really is fun. You know you've <coughs> arrived. You know you're uh, accomplished when you can start on the flight deck of the space shuttle and push in the right direction and start down through the hatch around the mid-deck kind of end up back where you started <laughs> without touching anything you know you're, you're, you're really getting good at navigating in zero gravity so. um, it's just you put all that stuff together it's the best job in the world just to have the ability to go up there and see and do all that stuff anything else? Uh, what kind of stuff do you like retired astronauts do for hobbies? Because I imagine you guys have like a need for doing something like extraordinary or like a, a lot of the astronauts that when they retire from NASA go to work in the in the aerospace business industries with some of the big uh, contractors and people building future spacecraft. Or some of them are designers, some of them are engineers, some of them are managers. So a lot of astronauts just go on the book and speaking tours. Some people don't do anything. Uh, Probably 10% of them, if they didn't come from a college environment, they may go back to want to be a professor or an educator in the university system. I've got four or five dear friends who do that around the United States at different colleges. I, the first thing I did after I retired, I worked 10 years as a venture capitalist. So I put together an investment fund who did that for about 10 years and learned a lot about finance. I've been fortunate to, uh, about 10 years ago, we started a program out here where we, where we would have a visiting astronaut every day. I kind of coordinate that now, so I still get to spend a lot of time here at the Kennedy Space Center. So, probably do retire in another year or two would be about my fourth retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is you can pretty much do whatever that you'd like to. Uh, Mark Garneau from Canada is a member of Parliament. He was. I know you've gotten beaten in the last go round. We've had some politicians. John Glenn was a senator from the United States for many years. I think he even ran for president once. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? So many astronauts total have there been? How many astronauts? I don't know about. There have been right around 500 people from those 38 nations over the last 50 years. I, I'm guessing between the 500, there's probably a couple hundred from Russia and a couple hundred from the United States, the other hundred are from the other 35 nations. Yeah. Uh, behind the uh, U.S. and Russia, the next leading nations in that number of astronauts would be Canada, Germany, um, Japan, and France. They probably, each, each of them have at least five and some of them maybe ten astronauts. We've got a couple of our four astronauts to come and talk out here. We're going to have Marcos Pontes coming from Brazil. 
Julie Payette, Canada that's coming down. Do what I do for a week or so. Anything else? We do have a, uh, every year, a Congress, we call it, of all the astronauts and cosmonauts. And, we, and we've been to most of these nations, as I mentioned. Well, of the 38 nations who've flown people into space, I think we've been to about 26 of them. And we're still going to the ones we have. We're, I think we're scheduled on visit to Switzerland, which we haven't visited. We've got one Swiss astronaut. This year we're going to Saudi Arabia. We've got one Saudi astronaut he flew with us. Uh, started all off in Mexico. First Congress we had was in, I'm sorry, in Paris. When we started getting together in 1985, Russia and America weren't very good friends, were they? Remember that stuff? Cold War? So when the astronauts and cosmonauts who'd been in contact for years said we'd like to sit down and talk, we couldn't do it pretty much in Europe or in Russia, and we couldn't do it in the United States. So we had one Frenchman who'd flown with the uh, Russians, Jean-Luc Cretin. So why don't you guys meet in Paris? I'll host it. So there were about 18, 22 astronauts and cosmonauts from Russia and a couple other nations who met in Mexico City in 1985. That's been 26 years ago, right in the middle of the Cold War. And obviously, when those guys got back to Russia and America, the governments were why did you guys do that? How could you, <laughs> why are you sitting down talking without us, the government? We should be there. So we kind of ignored them and went on, and the next year we met Mexico, and the year after that we went to Hungary, and now we're at our 27th Congress in Saudi Arabia, and I think next year in Switzerland. So we do get to all the nations of our countries who've flown people into space. We've met Canada. Don't have a Kiwi yet. We need to get a Kiwi astronaut. We got a couple of Australians, but we haven't met there yet. So we're going to be doing that probably in the next three or four years. It's a wonderful group of people. I can't tell you how magical the feeling is when you get together. The year before last, we met in Malaysia. We got one Malaysian cosmonaut who flew with the Russians and invited us all over. And he got married the weekend we were there, so it was a big celebration all over <laughs> Malaysia that, that corresponded to our astronaut cosmonaut thing. So it's a, you know, heads of state, kings and queens, whoever is ruling the nations usually always meets us when we have our congresses and have been to different nations. So my career, I've met just, I've met every president since John Kennedy. And uh, met a lot of kings and queens and prime ministers, folks from many nations around the world during my, my tenure as an astronaut. So it's been a wonderful ride. People say, well, who are some of the favorites that you've met? I, uh, Jesse Owens, I don't know whether anybody remembers Jesse Owens. He was a young black man who ran in the Olympics back in 1932 and won four gold medals. He was one. I just spent about an hour with him one time. Just ran into him in a, a private terminal up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we got to talk for about an hour. One of those memories that you'll never forget. And we had a, a general in World War II from America by the name of Omar Bradley, <coughs> five star general. And I got to spend a couple hours with him, just the two of us, one time. Those are the kind of things where you wish you'd had a tape recorder and you could have retaped the conversation with people like that. So it has been a wonderful, wonderful life for me. And I'm just, well, I'm honored to be here with you today. And I hope that you had a wonderful visit and spread the word around and get some, come back and see us. Uh, we're in the process. Of, have, they, have they visited the Space Center? I'm sorry? Do they get to go to the Space Center? Uh, if it's, yeah. If yeah. They, we are, uh, as you, as you know, we retired the space shuttle fleet, and we had three remaining flying space shuttles, the Atlantis, the Endeavour, and the Discovery. We're in the process out here now of uh, making them ready to go to various museums around the country for permanent display. The Discovery will leave next month to fly up the Air and Space Museum in Washington. Uh, the Endeavour will leave, I think, in April to go west to Los Angeles. And we're going to keep the Atlantis here at Kennedy. We're happy about that. <laughs> and if you haven't been to the center, or if you go to the center, you'll see a big construction effort going on right now. And that's where we're building a home for Atlantis that should be ready a little over a year from now. So come back and see it. It's going to be beautiful. Most of the people receiving shuttles are going to put them on the ground, landing gear down, sitting on the ground. We're going to suspend ours in flight with the payload bay doors open, and the robotic arm out with an astronaut. So, so it's going to be really neat. It's going to be about as cool as it can get. <clears throat> the building uh, is going to be larger than the shuttle launch experience, which is a huge building. So 
the houses thing in flight. There's going to be 20 or so interactive things you can do inside the building. It's just a, a wonderful venue. I think when it all comes together, you could probably spend half of your day inside that one building and never see the same thing. So, and we're also building a new entryway into the Space Center. Over the next five or six years, we're going to build a huge museum complex there that will house all the memorabilia from Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, and Space Shuttle. It's going to be real nice. So, don't think when you come here this time, you've seen everything that Kennedy has. You might have seen it now, but next year it'll change. The year after that it'll change. You get better. So, keep coming back. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. It's hard to see everything we like for you to see, including the Hall of Fame. You can't see it one day. It's already nearly a full two-day experience, and it's just going to get bigger and better. Anything else before I go? Get out of your way. Enjoy your. Well, thank you so much for thank you. Hands, kiss babies, yeah. that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, kind of a case of good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is you're all now astronaut candidates. Uh, the bad news is all your training is for the space shuttle, and we've retired the space yeah. shuttle a little while ago. <laughs> so hopefully your training will fit you for the next program. So to help you with your future application, everyone's going to receive a certificate of completion signed by Captain John McBride. He's a big shot over there, so he's yeah. a lot of weight. Also, he was nice enough to autograph uh, and personalize. Oh, yeah. But wait, there is more. If you act now, you also receive the coveted ATX pen. Ooh. Don't scoff. These are just like the ones the astronauts use here on Earth. But contrary to popular belief, they do not write upside down. As you can see, nothing happens. <laughs> Ulterior motive to the pens, we do have a quick evaluation we'd like you to fill out. Circling some numbers, let us know about things you liked, maybe things you didn't like so much. Your input really helps us with the program as we move along. So, as I call out your name, please stand up, be recognized by your peers, and receive your accolades. First up, doing a great job of getting everyone home safely, <laughs> landing so well he decided to do it twice. <laughs> Eric, Commander. <laughs> and helping him out with that, deploying the landing gear and the drag chute, making sure everyone was safe. <laughs> Pilot today, John. Come on, John. Our mission specialist one doing a good job getting that MPLM in the right position, Isabel. Come on, very nice. A true surgeon with that robotic arm, getting it where it needs to go, mission specialist two, James. And working on those experiments. Making sure all the work was done. Mission Specialist 3, Juan, coming up, very nice. <laughs> and helping him out with that, our Mission Specialist 4, doing a good job with those canisters, Antonio. Hey. Big boss today, making sure everyone was doing their job wise beyond his years, Flight Director Mateus. Our Flight Dynamics Officer, the mathematician of the group, doing a good job with the countdown, Robert. Go it up. And I think she has a future in radio, doing a great job as her public affairs officer, Francisca. Okay. All right. And doing a great job as our ecom all over those emergencies, Angela, coming up. And doing a good job monitoring the health of the crew, our science medical officer, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. That's my middle name. That's right. 
I gotta get your photo. Oh, okay, sounds good. All right, excellent. All right, so as you finish those, you can just leave them up here. Uh, then we can show you off into our museum and our Sims room. In our museums, we have a lot of great artifacts. We have an actual Murphy capsule that's been into split space and back, flown by Wally Shira, the fifth American man into space. Uh, we also have Alan Shepard's practice suit from when he walked on the moon, uh, Gus Grissom's suit from when he flew in Mercury. Uh, also, we have in our Sims room, we have another simulator you can try. We have a G-Force trainer in there. It's a centrifuge that at its peak is going to bring you up to about four Gs of pressure. What that means is if you weigh 200 pounds, it's going to feel like you weigh 800 pounds on this. Uh, just a piece of advice, that one has its own sickness bag. Just give you an idea <laughs> on how much more intense that is than okay. this. Then if you do any shopping in our gift shop, make sure you show them your name badge, let them know you're a part of ATX, and you'll get 10% off of any purchases you make in there. I, th I don't want to speak on behalf of John, but I can say you guys have been the best group I've had so far today. Thank you so much. For <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say that honestly. I know you have a lot of choices here in Central Florida. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with us at the Astronaut Training Experience. Uh, on behalf of myself, uh, Captain McBride, Arad, Carrie, everyone else who helped out, thank you so much for joining us. Have a safe trip back wherever you're going and enjoy the rest of your time here in Central Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.